Everyone knew of Judy the singer, possibly one of the greatest painters of our time. But what I discovered was her ability as a conversationalist. On Judy's first TV appearance with me, we talked more than she sang, and that was a side of her which was my discovery. I often had her on the program where she never was allowed to sing. I only wanted to hear her talk. Judy was very funny off stage as well. Never bawdy. It was rather a grand manner that she had. And at times, you would have thought she came from a high social background rather than her born-in-a-trunk backstage upbringing. I recall a few lines from her. Uh, we were speaking of a well-known actress who was known for her bed-hopping. And I said uh, to her, uh, Isn't so-and-so a nymphomaniac? And Judy said, Only if you can calm her down. She told me that when she was a young star making a children's picture which became a classic, The Wizard of Oz, the dwarfs were very fresh and sexy with her. She also said that they were usually drunk and you, that you had to capture them with butterfly nets. One munchkin said to her, I would like to give you a sexual experience that you'll never forget. And Judy replied, Well, if you do, and I find out about it. Judy could be the most difficult, talented person in show business. Many TV shows would not touch her because of her unreliability. She would always refuse to come out of her dressing room. You had to beg her. She would not come to rehearsal. But that was only when shows were taped and she knew she could get away with it. But why? When shows were live, she would appear seconds before her appearance and give everybody a mild cardiac attack. To this day, I cannot figure the reason for it. I will now give you an hour-by-hour hour account of my date with Judy. 10 a.m. Scene, Judy's home in Westwood. Jack Haley, Jr., the producer for a Walper special that I was doing, and I arrive at Judy's house. We're taken into a living room in a medium-sized Hollywood home. The living room has obviously had a party the night before, as there is a motion picture projector with film all over the floor. After a half hour, Judy enters in an old-fashioned dress, sweet but wearing a great big floppy hat, the kind that Janet Gaynor wore in pictures. 11 a.m. Judy is very sweet at first, but has a strange look in her eye. She asks me to speak to her alone. The two of us go into her den, and she says, Get rid of that guy. I have never met him before, but I hated his father. His father was Jack Haley, who appeared as the uh, tin woodman with Judy in The Wizard of Oz. I try to tell Judy that she is being rude to young Haley, and I am embarrassed. Poor Jack said nothing to disturb her, and indeed is anxious to get out of the house because he feels the enmity. I beg Judy to be polite to him, and she and I plan to go to the Brown Derby for lunch. I know that Jack is ill at ease, and this will be a way of breaking off the pending hatred on her part. I don't know what it's all about. Young Jack and she had never met, but she hated his father and now hates him. Young Haley leaves in a taxi and leaves the car for me. What is strange about all this is that later, Liza marries this very man, Jack Haley Jr., and it's announced that they were all old family friends. 12 noon. Somebody comes to her door, serves a summons, and reclaims her only automobile. The week before this, she was given notice to vacate her home because the mortgage company was reclaiming the house. She tells me all of this, still wearing that ridiculous hat, and says, Oh, well, behind every cloud, there's another cloud. 12.30 p.m. Judy and I are driving down Sunset Boulevard and stop at a light. A great big stretch limousine pulls up to our right with dark funereal windows. The window on her side of the limo comes down. And there he is, the man. No doubt about it. The voice says in a southern country accent, Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Elvis Presley. I just want you to know that you're the greatest entertainer in the world. Judy is very grand and says, Thank you. At that point, I lean over across her and say, Hi, Elvis. I'm Jack Parr. The dark window goes up. I'm sure almost faster than usual. And the car speeds off. Judy thinks that's really hilarious. I can see that she is so pleased by this great compliment to her and at my embarrassment. You see, show people are like puppies. They, they love compliments. If actors had tails, they would be wagging them most of the time. Love me, love me, love me. 
1 p.m. We arrive at the Beverly Hills Brown Derby. She makes a great entrance, uh, lessened only by the waiter's reaction, and I sense that she's been there before under dramatic circumstances. She orders vodka and tonic. I have white wine. 1.30 p.m. Judy doesn't want to order food, but has a few vodkas to relax. This is unusual for Judy, as she most often drinks Blue Nun wine. I get worried and think if there's going to be a problem or a scene, I had better get my wife there. I call and leave word at the Beverly Hills Hotel to tell Miriam, who is shopping, that it's Mayday, Mayday. Join us. 2 p.m. It goes on that way until about 3 p.m. Now, at no point is Judy anything but regal. There's hardly room in the booth for me, Miriam, who joins us, Judy, and that crazy, uh, voile sombrero she's wearing. She doesn't want any food, but how about another drinky-poo? 3 p.m. We tell her that we must go back to the hotel and ask if we could take her home. She insists on joining us. We leave the Brown Derby and drive to the Beverly Hills Hotel. As we arrive under the canopy and park the car, Judy sees, now get this, James Mason getting out of the car. She yells, Jimmy, Jimmy, and rushes to meet him. Mason is a very civilized man and a cool cat if there ever was one. He sees Judy out of the corner of his eye senses a reunion he doesn't wish for, dashes, and disappears into the lobby. Now, as an observer, I wish to point out to you this irony. In their picture together, A Star is Born, it was Judy who was the young, sober actress, and James, the drunken director, who was the problem. I'll never forget that moment. 4 p.m. Judy wants to eat. We call room service, and she wants a tossed salad, which, after another vodka and tonic, she begins really to toss. There may be a little on the chandelier to this day. None of this, you understand, is crazy drunkenness. It's with the sweetest look and the best manners of anyone in the room. It's just a euphoric, happy time. Judy always has class, and it even shows then. 5 p.m. I'm called down to the polo lounge of the hotel for an interview and must leave my wife alone with Judy. Judy begins to tell Miriam her troubles and wants to borrow $10 and a raincoat as she had lost hers. Miriam gives her both. Judy tells Miriam that tomorrow will be a better day as she's going to 20th Century Fox to audition for an important part in the movie version of Valley of the Dolls. She then begins to speak very frankly of sex, which scares the hell out of Miriam. Miriam goes to a phone in the bedroom and calls her friend Dorothy Aberback and says, Mayday, Mayday, Judy's here, come right over. 6 p.m. I return from the polo lounge and explain to Judy that we have a dinner date at La Scala with old friends Mr. and Mrs. Paul Keyes. Judy insists on joining us. Now, I do not want this and make up a story that it wouldn't be fair to her, Judy, since this dinner is obligatory and would be, I said, with two of the dullest people on earth. They would bore her beyond all endurance. No, I plead. I can't do this to you, darling. Dull, dull, boring people. Well, now, let me explain that the Keyses are old, dear friends. Paul was with me for nine years, five on tonight, and nearly four on my other shows and specials. He always traveled with me through North Africa, the Soviet Union, and Europe. When I more or less retired from television, Paul went to the West Coast, and wrote first for Dean Martin, then wrote and produced Laughing. He now writes for and produces the Frank Sinatra shows. He has won Emmys for his writing and producing. It was Paul who said in an interview, I love Parr. I fought my way out of three countries with him. So as Miriam and I enter La Scala with Judy, there is no way to let the keys know we now have a problem. I say we because I always include my friends in my problems. It keeps them young and on their toes. They're delighted to see Judy, as they have never met, and they don't know she's well on her way to a major headache, to say the least. Judy, still the perfect lady, but bombed, opens the conversation by looking them straight in the eye and saying, Mr. and Mrs. Keys, I believe uh, those are your names, tell me, please, why are you both so dull? I could die. There's no way to explain to Paul that it was an excuse to avoid bringing her. They are stunned because they don't know she has a liquor problem, that I have made up this story. And besides, they have never met her before. She goes on. Everybody uses my, my best friend Jack. 
All the dull people in the world, all the boring people used poor, wonderful Jack. And Miriam, she says to my wife, sometimes you're boring. Please n try not to be. Work on it. We must save Jack from dullness. Miriam gets Judy to the ladies' room, and then I'm able to explain to Paul and his wife my dissembling, my, my lie, actually. When they return from the loo, we order spaghetti with an Alka-Seltzer sauce. Paul and I are thinking of various ways we could get her home. I didn't drive to her house that morning, Haley did, and now I cannot remember uh, an unfamiliar part of Westwood. Judy refuses to tell me how to get there. When a person is devoted to a cause, when she has started a campaign to stamp out all the dullness in the world, she doesn't want to go home. 9.30 p.m. We all get in Paul's car and start down toward the ocean on Wilshire Boulevard. This certainly is a move in the right direction. As we're going down the boulevard, Judy screams, Stop! I want out! I know somebody who lives in that building. Well, we're delighted because now we can get information about where she lives or deposit her safely with whomever lives in that building. She runs across the street, I run after her, and she tells me that Sid Luft lives in this apartment. Sid Luft was her former husband and the father of Lorna and Joe, the children of Judy and Sid, half-siblings of Liza. Looking on the mailbox board, I cannot find a Sid Luft, but she insists she knows he lives there. Please leave and go back to your dull friends, she says. Then very grandly, she turns on the garland charm and says, You've been very charming. It's been a lovely day. Day. Dear God, I thought it was the whole month of October. I know that Judy had at least the ten dollars that Miriam gave her if she wanted to take a taxi. So I went back to the car and watched this great, great star who was now auditioning for a part in a Sherlock picture the next morning. Judy now goes around the building, down an alley, and into a U-shaped courtyard. It's very dark. We pull our car in, and there's Judy looking up at our four apartment floors, and she begins to yell, Sid! 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 Windows begin to open. People stick their heads out, and in our car headlights, we see her take off her at crazy hat. Look up at all the windows, and say, as she makes a deep theatrical bow, It's me! I'm Judy Garland! I'm Judy Garland. Cut and print. I have seldom witnessed a more dramatic moment. When I returned to the room that night, I went to take an aspirin and found that our entire kit of traveling medical supplies was missing. Judy was found the next morning, safe and well, sleeping on a pool table at 20th Century Fox. She did not get the part. Months later, we received this telegram. It read, I know that Mother would want you to be at her funeral. Please come and do not wear any dark, sad clothes. Do you have a yellow suit? Love, Liza.